I have had the benefit of knowing Jen for 20 years. We went to college together. And if there was anyone in college who you thought was going to do something, be something, that grow it would be it you. It, no, not It true. was Jen. Um, and now Rent the Runway is on the lists of the most disruptive companies with Uber, with SpaceX, with Airbnb. But I know, personally, it wasn't always so obvious to everyone else. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about your journey. Um, what was the spark that sort of lit the fire that got you to start this company? Yeah, well, first, just because I'm looking at the audience and maybe people here don't know what Rent the Runway is, <laughs> but very simply, we're a company. You're all well-dressed, by the way. That's not what you're We're a saying. company <laughs> where we rent designer clothing to women, and we do it for special occasions. That's where we started. And over the last nine years, we've evolved to rent for every occasion. So it's a subscription to fashion that women are using every day to go to work, to dress up on the weekends, to go on vacation. When they get pregnant, they could have their subscription to Rent the Runway. Now, sitting here in 2018, it's pretty well established that people value experiences over ownership. But back in 2008, when I had the idea for Rent the Runway, it was pretty radical to think that the experience economy would come to the closet. But I really felt that the experience of putting on great clothes that make you feel like you're most confident, it's like a suit of armor before you go to a meeting, before you go out on a date, and that if we could empower people with that feeling every single day, that we could actually change their lives. So it was that insight that clothing was more than just a utility, it was actually really emotional for people. I remember there was a point like five years ago where you said to me, it's like Netflix, it's gonna be like Netflix for clothes. And I was like, really? I mean, what made you think that people will want to rent rather than own their clothes? Well, I think that the very best business ideas come out of things that people are already doing. So Rent the Runway has existed you know, for decades in the way that we shop, in the way that we get dressed. Whenever you go into H&M or you go into Zara or you buy something cheap on Amazon that you know you're only going to wear once or you know it's going to fall apart after you put it in a washing, ma washing machine a few times, you're effectively renting. So for decades, we have been consuming via fast fashion. That's actually 85% of the American fashion wallet goes to one-time use clothing. And so all I'm doing is I'm substituting the junk food that you're buying from Zara and H&M with high quality designer pieces that you could have on rotation. This is a $2.4 trillion industry, right? The apparel industry. Yes, it's $2.4 trillion in sales mm -hmm. per year, but the average American closet holds 10 years of clothes. So we're sitting on $24 trillion, and 80% of the closet is worn three times or less. Think of how crazy that is. Like, no matter where your parents grew up in the world, no matter what income your parents had, they never would have purchased an article of clothing had they known that they would only wear it once. Now that's the majority of what people are buying. And it's because we want variety. It's because clothing makes us feel awesome about ourselves. We want to express ourselves in different ways. So it's been a revolution in consumer behavior. And Rent the Runway is just the piece that's taking the friction out of giving people newness and variety every day. These days, it seems like anybody who wants to start an e-commerce company, people say, why? Why? There's Amazon. Now Amazon is getting into apparel, you know, what makes you think that you can own such a big piece of the market where you have a giant with unlimited resources? Well, any business that thinks that, you know, they're not competing against Amazon is effectively naive <laughs> at this point. But we've spent the last nine years investing in technology and operations to be able to rent clothes. So currently, we run at Rent the Runway the largest dry cleaning operation in the world for instance. Right, talk That's, about the warehouse, because the warehouse is pretty intense. I mean, that is like the heart yeah, of the I company. Yeah, I mean, we're, in a, we're a logistics company. We have to receive back dirty, worn clothes <laughs> from millions of people all over the country. We get them back at 6 a.m. off of planes and trucks, and by 8 p.m. that evening, we have to have inspected, quality controlled, dry cleaned, repair, restored every single article of clothing and shipped it out to new customers, same day. So it's a really intense logistical operation, and it's taken us, we had to 
you know, build it from scratch, iterate it, and there's no way to short circuit the learnings, right? The learnings we had when we rented our first thousand articles of clothing were totally different than the learnings we got after the first hundred thousand, after the first million, after the first 10 million, after the first 25 million. So let's say another company wanted to do this and they wanted to come and invest, you know, a billion dollars in building Rent the Runway. Well, they'd also have to go through the process of dry cleaning items tens of millions of times, get tens of millions of customers right off the bat to do that. So it would take a good amount of time to replicate the IP that we've built. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, you have, I've seen you grown, grow as a leader and you've taken on issues like women in tech, you've taken on minorities in tech, you've taken on benefits. Um, how has your own sort of style evolved as the company has grown and what's given you sort of the courage to speak out on some of these things? Well, I'm in the position that I'm in right now running a business that, you know, has made some impact on the world and will continue to grow because I have a team of 1,600 people who work at Rent the Runway. And I think that two often business leaders forget that they're not in this position that they're in because of their own talent or their own um, work ethic alone. It's a group of people that have brought us to the place that we're at. And I think that business leaders have a responsibility to step up and be moral leaders in addition to just caring about the bottom line and that we should be doing things to make our employees' lives better. What did you do when you ran into people who didn't believe in what you were doing? Well, one of the things that I did recently at Rent the Runway that I'm most proud of uh, out of anything that I've ever done is that in April of this year, I decided to equalize benefits amongst my salary, salaried and hourly employees. And so when it comes to things like parental leave or paid family sick leave or um, bereavement leave, now employees who work in my warehouse have the exact same benefits as my corporate employees. This was a really radical decision. Right, they, they don't, don't do that at... They don't do it at Starbucks. They don't do this at Facebook. They don't do this at Apple. At the most progressive companies in the world, there are two different classes of employees. And often what happens is that those employees who work in warehouses or call center teams who typically come from um, less wealthy backgrounds, who typically come from um, environments where they didn't receive the same kind of educational opportunities as those that go on and work in corporate teams, they're also, because their benefits are so bare bones, they're given no flexibility. So take a situation where someone is becoming a parent. If you work in a corporate office at a startup, you're often giving, given months off of paid parental leave to be a great parent. You are given flexibility in how you come back to your job. If you work in a warehouse, you're given like one week off paid and good luck to you. You have to make a choice. Do I want to be a great parent or do I want to have a job? And so I decided I didn't want to run a company that treated people unequally and that I wanted the exact same benefits that I give myself to be given to every single employee who works at Rent the Runway. Rent the Runway also looks a lot different than a lot of other tech companies. It's like 70 some percent women and minorities? It's 70 plus percent female and it's also 70 percent non-white. How do you think that changes your results? It makes us much better. You know, if you're building a mass market product, which we are, so Rent the Runway customers represent 76% of all zip codes in the United States, meaning that our customer base cuts across class, race, ethnicity, geography. If that's gonna be the case, I need an a team of employees who represent the diversity of this country that come up with ideas of how to continuously disrupt ourselves and propel the business forward. Now, not only that, like, I don't understand why we're even having this conversation, why it's so difficult for people to build diverse teams. It's fundamentally not. And I think that when It's not difficult. How do you No. Do I hire the best people out there, and the best people out there happen to be women, people of color, immigrants, you know, diverse teams. So I think that when people get up and talk about how difficult it is to bring a woman onto their team or a person of color, I think fundamentally they're not trying. 
than that they, they don't espouse the values around diversity. If you hold a value set around diversity of opinion, of diversity of people around you, then it's very easy to build that team. There's also an astonishing lack of diversity in who gets funding in Silicon Valley. Women-led companies get 2% of funding. 2%. Um, in an industry that calls itself a meritocracy. You wrote a book about that. <laughs> um, I did. Um, um, and it's amazing. It's called Brotopia. <laughs> we didn't play. One of my favorite books. Um, <laughs> why do investors continue to miss out on these opportunities? Like, wh why aren't they investing in more people who look like you? Uh, twofold. Number one is I think that people invest in both people and ideas that they're comfortable with and that they have experience around. And that often it's easier to invest in people who look like you and ideas that look like you. Like, you played video games when you were a little boy, so now you'll invest in other boys who are playing video games later on. If I'm starting a company where 100% of my customers are women, and 100% of investors are male, it's a harder hurdle to overcome when I talk about the power that women derive from putting on that fashion, from putting on that suit of armor, because a lot of men um, don't necessarily, or a lot of men who work in VC, don't necessarily feel the same way. So you have to bridge kind of an emotional gap, because it is true that investors, they do get behind their investments, they have to emotionally invest in that idea, in that founder, building a company. I've already been doing this for 10 years. It's likely that I'm gonna spend the next few decades of my life building Rent the Runway. That's the level of passion you have to have for your idea. So investors, likewise, have to have that level of passion for the ideas that they invest in. So I get it that you want to invest around the things that you know and that you believe in. And I think that a lot of Female founders happen to have businesses as well that cater towards women. Um, I'm going to start taking questions in a moment. So for the people in this room who are looking to put their money somewhere, how do they not fall into that trap? We all want to, if you're putting money behind someone, you want to be able to connect with it emotionally, right? Like, what's your advice? I do think that it is real. Well, first of all, the people in this room um, are more diverse than <laughs> VC investors. That's great. I actually think that investing behind things that you're passionate about, around people that you're passionate around, helping founders um, become better leaders. Like, if anything, when you're an athlete, you're on a team. You have to learn how to lead. Like, that sort of feedback that you could give to a founder, to a founding team, is unbelievably valuable. So I do think that there's nothing bad in investing behind the things where you could add the most value and where you have the most passion. And that hopefully the interests in this room are, are quite diverse, so there'll be a lot of ideas that people invest in. Questions? One. Come on, let's keep it interesting. <laughs> All right, right here. We don't, we don't cater to men right now. So it's 100% uh, female. In the future, are you, are you going to cater to men? Yeah, we plan to expand into every segment, you know, of thinking about the full closet and just ensuring that the full closet is going into the cloud. Cool, I'll be your first customer. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Um, I spoke to a very wealthy woman in uh, New York City who basically only shops on Rent the Runway, only uses Rent the Runway. She just basically completely stopped buying any clothes, and that's all she does. Um, do you see that as like the future of your customers, or do you see it them having like a diversity of like a little bit of supply here, a little bit of supply, you know, with Rent the Runway, or is it something like all or nothing? Well, let's actually talk about, for a second, like what Spotify has done to the music industry. So we, in 1990, the average American family bought two CDs a year. So when you bought music, you were choosing people and, and bands that you likely already had affinity to. And then suddenly, we all had these subscriptions to Spotify or Apple Music. And what happened was, the average American now listens to 30x more music than we did in 1990. 
So really simply, like music is more important in our lives today than it was, and we're discovering more music, and we're falling in love with more artists. It's the same thing that an unlimited subscription to fashion does. You're not gonna stop buying and investing in the pieces that you wanna wear every day. People are gonna buy jeans, and they're gonna buy black blazers, and they're gonna buy sweaters, but for like the printed skirt that you want to use every day for the blouse that you're gonna wear with your jeans, you could have those on rotation. So the idea of an unlimited subscription is to remove the friction around purchase, to separate the act of wearing from the act of owning. And when you do that, you could basically 100x the amount of clothes that someone's able to access and therefore the amount of self-expression they're able to do. Right? Clothes are the only thing that can communicate who you are without you ever having to speak a word. And the ability for you to do that differently every single day or to express different sides of yourself through fashion, like who you are at work is fundamentally going to be different than who you might want to, what you might want to feel like when you're on a beach, when you're with your friends, when you're on a vacation. So I think that what we're trying to do is that, giving people power to use fashion to express themselves however they want. There's such a taboo around um, you'd go to a wedding and you'd never say that, like, I don't own this dress. Um, I think now you've done such a great job that it's kind of cool to be, you know, use rant the wrong way. Did you actively do that through, like, PR and brand awareness, or did that just happen naturally because so many people were doing it and they were like, actually, I'm okay telling people I don't own this item? I think that we created a brand that women felt proud of talking about. And, you know, it's natural that women want to share how, when they do something that's smart. When they find a deal, you know, you often want to tell all of your friends. And what we did is we harnessed the most powerful marketing tool ever, which was the power of a compliment. Okay, so the initial inventory that we rented on Rent the Runway was not just dresses, but they were like red dresses or sequin dresses or dresses with cutouts where you would walk into a room and everyone would look at you. And you know, the number one icebreaker amongst women is, oh my God, you look so great, what are you wearing? <laughs> and that naturally started a conversation where women were getting compliments and they were sharing the secret of Rent the Runway. And we saw that those compliments were spreading the business really virally. Like it's been nine years and we haven't had to spend money to market Rent the Runway. And similarly, when we launched our subscription and people started to use us every single day, they're now showing up to the office 150 days of the year and they're renting clothes. And they're wearing stuff that is bolder and more colorful and more printed. And they're walking billboards now for Rent the Runway. So we started to see that once one woman in an office has a subscription, often there will be five and then 10 and then 50 women. Like we have, sla we have just learned that a lot of startups in the US have Slack channels that are dedicated to Rent the Runway Unlimited, <laughs> where they just talk about their subscriptions amongst each other. So we're, it's really fun to see it take off, you know, um, offline. Last question. Thank um, you. Oh, sorry. Uh, quick question for you on the supply side. So have you had any interesting discussions with designers or design houses that have sort of said, we don't want our stuff up on Run the Runway, and then the second is, do you see your model evolving to Amazon Basics where you will be the design house because it'll be much cheaper from a cost of goods sold perspective than? Well, I was the most hated person in the fashion industry for many years. People <laughs> thought, of course, given that I was renting clothes that um, we were potentially gonna cannibalize a designer's business or dilute their brand, but I kept on saying to designers, listen, we're gonna open up the market for you to the tens of millions of people who have never been able to afford your brand before. And we're gonna enable those people to have these Cinderella moments with fashion. So I begged you know, my first 25 brands to get on board in 2009 and they came on board and I used the data from those brands to prove that this really was opening up the market to a completely different customer and a different type of inventory that they were even renting from Rent the Runway. So now we have over 600 brand relationships. You know, brands are coming to us 
to our platform wanting to, you know, not only rent their clothes, but also design things with us. So to answer your second question, we use the wealth of data that we have now to build collections with designers and customize content, very similar to what Netflix has done, where they've gone from buying content from Hollywood to now producing content using the data that they have. So there's been a lot of really interesting evolution that um, our data has enabled us to do. We've seen a lot of traditionally e-commerce companies experiment with brick and mortar, whether it's Warby Parker or Bonobos, and you have also experimented with brick and mortar mortar. Going forward, do you see expanding your physical offline operations? And how much of our shopping will be online versus offline? I think that in the future, you're going to be able to have access within a few blocks of where you live to a closet that you can open up 24 hours a day with inventory that's personalized to you. So how our, our stores function today is that you're beaconed into the store, we recognize you're there, you can bring back clothes you've already worn and you could take anything off the shelf and then scan it and walk out without paying. So we've effectively um, legalized shoplifting in our <laughs> stores, which is a really magical experience, right? It's kind of like this Willy Wonka experience where you could go into a store and take anything and it's priceless shopping. So that idea that we could, if your closet is going to be in the cloud, you know, our store can be the manifestation of your dressing room. So what's interesting in our stores today is that the busiest hours of the day in our store are between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Because we have troves of women who are coming into the store and they're getting dressed for work in the store. <laughs> and once I saw that behavior, I was like, we're really on to something. Like, this is going to be, you know, the new way that people get dressed. You know, they'll go to the gym in the morning, then they'll come into their Rent the Runway store, get dressed, and go to work. And then come back in the evening for cocktail <laughs> We do hour. have women who come in <laughs> twice a day. Um, I told you she had a big vision, everybody. Legalize shoplifting. Um, Jen Hyman, CEO of Rent the Runway, thank you so thank much. You.